Hi, I'm Dorian Biro. And I'm Ricardo Virgilio. And we are going to present you the Wolfram Client Library for Python. Okay. Hi, everyone. I think we can try to get started in the meantime while other people maybe are coming. It's very early in the morning. I hope you got a good coffee. Um, I think it's worth it. It's a, it's, a, it's a really nice project that we have been doing. Um, and uh, uh, it's going to be, it, it's an open source project that we have been done with Dorian here. And um, basically what happened was that inside the company we were using Python for several reasons. And most of us were uh, re-implementing the same stuff over and over again. There was some logic like data serialization, data deserialization that was coming all over the place, right? And uh, we said, well, this should not happen. We should try to factorize this functionality. And so this is how <coughs> everything started. I started doing this. I started creating uh, data serialization. It was creating from, uh, from Python um, input form. And then uh, we started adding <coughs> more and more functionalities to the project. A couple of words about me. I am uh, Ricardo. This is Dorian. I am from Italy. He's from France. And uh, we have been working with the company for several years now. <coughs> and we are the only two contributors of the project. Right now, it's like 100% of the lines is written by us. Probably this is going to change in the future. I hope it's going to change in the future, uh, which is why we're, <coughs> we're going open source. <coughs> so. Let's see what we're talking about. Um, this is an open source library to manipulate and evaluate Wolfram language expression. We are providing a very simple entry point that is a single function for this functionality um, to do data serialization and another function to do deserialization. Um, and this is what I will be mostly talking about. And then Dorian um, implemented the, and will explain to you, how to work with local and cloud kernels. Uh, how you can start them, spawn them directly from within Python. Um, if you go down, the, the library is live from today. And this is the URL you can, uh, you can access it. And uh, there is also a documentation link that you can go. And pip install should be already working, right? It is. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So for the first part of the talk, we will see how uh, you can create from Python expressions. So there is a nice syntax uh, that we come up with. Um, that is used to generate Python expression from within Python to represent symbolic Python expression, uh, sorry, uh, Wolfram language expression. Um, we see how this was used internally um, for external evaluate and the benefits that we gain by starting using it. Thank you. Um, we will show um, how the library is already taking care for you a lot of um, uh, common data types that everyone is using. So all built-in data types of Python, including all structures. Um, then we will see how to um, serialize custom classes that you have. And that's support basically for serialization when you're using this library. Um, how you can easily switch from serializing uh, the, the input form to WXF, which is a format we are going to explain in a bit. And how to deserialize. <coughs> Wolfram language expressions. So I don't know if you are familiar with this because this is a new functionality in I think it was 11.2. They're called Python cell. They're really nice. And basically it shows that notebooks can really be used for uh, um, you know, any kind of language, not only Wolfram language. Uh, this is the direction that we are attempt to take in now. And as you see, the, it, it just looks like a code cell, except that when you, when you run it, it will use external evaluator to run uh, um, the code that, that is here. There are several kinds of cells that you can use. This is the Python one. 
we're going to recognize it by the logo. <coughs> and, and, and let's see what this, what this code is doing. So the entry point that I was speaking about uh, is, uh, maybe it's too close. Okay. We say from Wolfram client language, import WL. So what is WL? WL, um, if you're curious, you can check out the source code. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's really one of the nicest features of Python. It's, uh, um, there is a dynamic language that allows you to do um, very nice thing. And what is happening is that every time you access with, a, with an attribute, the dot syntax, it creates a symbol for you. And this is a symbol that, it, that is represented by a class in Python that is called Wolfram Language Symbol. And each time you call it with parentheses, it creates for you a Wolfram Language function. So with those two constructs, we can represent almost any expression in the Wolfram Language. <coughs> and so each time you do Wolfram Language dot pi, for example, it creates for you the symbol pi um, that, that, that um, and, and let's see what, what this is doing. So when, you, when we do export, this is now returning a byte array in, uh, uh, in the cells. But first, let's see what it's doing in a terminal. Where is the terminal? Yeah. It should come mm. up. Okay. So the this function returns Python 3 bytes or Python 2 string. Uh, and so the, the, the serializer always return uh, binary data. And you see that when you are doing, uh, when you are taking all those Python objects, they are serialized in the input form um, that is suitable to be used in Wolfram language. So you can just copy paste this code into a notebook and you will get out this code and try to do that, but it's very easy. <coughs> so we can just take this guy. Where is it? Six, yeah. mm -hmm. And put it somewhere in a notebook and evaluate it. And the same thing happens here in a Python cell if you just evaluate it. So we are using the very same uh, technology um, for Python cells. So every time you write Python code, the output of the Python code needs to be imported back in the kernel. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm the only one confused in the room, but I'm really confused. Sure. Can you help me here? When you have that statement, WL type the export statement, sure. where is that operating? Is that operating on the Python side? Python side. This is Python code. This is purely Python code. And it's getting, how does it know where the map It doesn't. It doesn't. It's just, it's just a symbol. So you're just creating an arbitrary symbol that is called map. It does nothing in Python. But only when you take that symbol and you put it into the kernel, the kernel knows what map is. It's got a meaning. There is an evaluator. And then it evaluates. So this thing first is coming out like the representation I showed you up. You need to imagine that when, you, when I'm executing this, this cell from Python, this is coming out like that guy. Then that guy evaluates. And this is why you get back false, true, 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 because map evaluates, but cannot evaluate, cannot possibly evaluate on the Python side. On the Python side, it's purely symbolic. So I'm, I'm just as confused perhaps as he is. Mm -hmm. um, the bracket WL pi statement Python interpreter then sends something to the Mathematica kernel. Right. The Mathematica kernel then sends something to the front end, and that's what produces out 86. Yeah, 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 yeah. something like that. It's, that right? uh, yeah, sure, sure. It's, uh, it's way easier probably, yeah, by just seeing that in the terminal. Um, so where is it? Mm -hmm. That wouldn't have worked. No. No. 
here I'm only on Python, okay? And I can do pipe. I mean, it's a bit confusing because also we we define a way to, I mean, wl.py is actually a class, as you can see. And we make sure that when you, when you print it in a terminal, for example, it displays nicely. So that's why you don't see wl symbol of something big. We just put the name of the symbol. So you, the, the line when it's written p only, this is, this is just Sorry. our way to, to print it. Yeah. So, so it, this is just a Python class that it's a really easy one. It got one attribute that is called name and is the symbol name. When you are creating a function, and let's say that I have something like, yeah, um, yeah, the same up. And you open close and to do what I was doing, right? Now this guy, if we do type again, this is a Wolfram language function. It's a Python class that represents function application. With those two constructs, we can represent almost any expression in Mathematica. <coughs> and can I ask though, if sure. you when you received back from the Python interpreter map prime p one p two, why did you not why was that not executed? Why was that not set to the Wolfram function? Which one? Uh, I'm sorry, if, if your line WL dot map mm -hmm. Darian will show you how to execute the code. Okay. But this is just, so the, the way it works is that in this library, we have this fundamental construct that allows you to generate expression. Then you decide what to do with them, okay? So in this case, first you create the expression. So you have a big chunk of code that is creating your Wolfram language expression. And then you decide what to do. So you can call the entry point of export, and that is producing, uh, you can save it to a file. You can save it uh, as a string, whatever. Or you take the same, very same expression and you do evaluate. And that will automatically start the kernel, send the expression there, ask for the result, deserialize back to the... And so all this logic, this boilerplate code, it's all implemented by the library. And we are using the very same code in external evaluate and in Python cells to do that. So the Python cell takes the takes the string of the Python code. Um, it, it's sent basically, um, it, it, it's doing eval. In Python, there is a function to evaluate Python code. We just evaluate it. Then the result is exported and evaluated into the kernel. Not all of them. No, you can see the, the, what is happening in the Python side in any case. <coughs> uh, there is no way to log those, um, those intermediate steps. And so, yeah, to get you even more confused, <laughs> if I do this, I'm creating now a bar chart expression. So from a Python cell, I have like this big computation that is producing data. And then I want to see this data. And I can just use Wolfram language for it. So I can just create a bar chart, take this data and visualize that directly. Or <coughs> I could have done that manually by just doing this. And then, you know, copy paste this guy and do bar chart. And with this syntax, you can also refer to arbitrary internal context by using this dot syntax. So you keep adding a dot, and it's like the Wolfram language backtick, so that you can refer to internal context. This really helps keeping the code clean when you are missing Python and Wolfram language code. I've been doing it for a um, for, for, uh, uh, for internals, and I might say that it really gives the code uh, readable because with this syntax, you know, 
um, when you are generating a, a Wolfram language expression, when you are generating Python expression, and so on and so forth. So, um, yeah. Can I say this is clear? <laughs> Mm -hmm. To run exactly the same code that you can run inside mathematically. Well, that was your example. Sure. That it's, I could see using Python code that you can't run in mathematics. Mm -hmm. and it's just, but why are we running bar charts through Python? You are. My Chrome interpreter also knows what to do. It, it'll learn and remember symbols too. It's like two engines working on the same code. This, this is one example. I mean, notebooks are amazing to do visualization. So <clears throat> you, you are working here just with Python, and then at some point you say, ah, let me, let me quickly see this data. And then you're using Wolfram language to do that. That is one use case. There are plenty of them. <clears throat> I hope people will figure out, I think this is a library that allows you to be very creative. And I can imagine all kind of acts going on with this library. But <clears throat> another thing that you can do is, uh, and you will show how to do it, you have, a, you have a Python code, right? And you, and you have a functionality that is missing in Python. You want to use Wolfram language for that. And you, can, and you can have a code that is creating a lot of Wolfram language expressions. Then you start up a kernel pool. And you start evaluating all those, uh, all those expressions in parallel, either on your local machine or on the Wolfram cloud. You get back the result, and you, and you aggregate them, and you continue in Python. So that, that allows basically to move from Python to Wolfram language, go back to Python, and continue. Which is the other direction of external evaluate. External evaluate, you are using Wolfram language. You start using Python with external evaluate. And then you continue Wolfram language. So this is the other direction. Can, can we um, go back to your bar chart example for just a second? Mm -hmm. Right. If the Python interpreter does know, no. then no when one you does. send that through the Python interpreter, will it plug in its values of A, B, C, and then promptly call the Wolfram engine? Oh, sure. If, if A got a value, yes. So th this is going to be, in this case, it's going to be system A. a you need to do global dot A. So then you do A equals to 13. And then... Uh, yeah, it depends from the context, and SME system, whatever. And so basically, you just need to refer it um, explicitly to, to, to the right context. What's the, uh, how does, does it also have the values in the Python code? Yeah, that, no. was, that was my question. Can so it get a symbol out of Python? Is a, is a variable it's Python. a variable. If A is a variable in Python, then of course, uh, yes, it just evaluates. Uh, so if you do A equals to... It yeah, exactly. Python thing and say A equals 30, or equals 50. Sure, sure, but that is, that, that is a, chart. yeah, but that is the difference. That is the difference. This is a Python variable. Yeah. Okay, that, that just evaluates right here. Yeah, it, it, and the yeah. other one, it's a symbolic A that is a variable that references to the kernel. So they are not the same A. <coughs> Mm -hmm. Right. So this factory allows you to identify what is Wolfram language. Everything that starts with this WL in your code is the Wolfram language stuff. Everything else is not. But in any case, I mean, this advance is uh, evaluating expression is something uh, uh, is something neat, is something that, you know, is very powerful. Also something that is an advanced use. Um, 
let's let's start with uh, with you know just regular data structure because another use case is that you have a library that is producing data right you are doing some kind of analysis in python and uh, you know you don't need symbols for that you only need data structures you only need lists dictionaries numbers reals stuff like that so you have a you have a set of data that is coming from a database, is coming from an AVI, and instead of using JSON to communicate it, you can directly use WXF now, <coughs> or, uh, or, uh, or, or, or the input form. That gets you the advantage of supporting a lot more data types than what JSON can do. So, the built-in type that we are supporting um, are all the obvious, so, List is supported, set is supported, set is, a, set is, the, set is, a, um, is a set of element that got no repetition. As you can see in set I got one, two, two, four, and the duplications get deleted. This is happening in Python. Set is a, is a data structure that got no duplicates. Uh, then there is the list, uh, since we don't have these data structures, we are always, those are all equivalent for us, they are all list. The other data structures that we do have is the dictionary that is transformed into an association. <clears throat> By default, what we have done is that everything that in Python got an iter method in the object is transformed and converted automatically into a Wolfram language list because we don't have as well generators. So we're thinking that the obvious thing to do when you got a generator is to transform it into a list. So we can evaluate this guy, Dorian. Mm -hmm. <coughs> this will be converted into a list. And you can see also the generator. This is a generator function that does yield. I don't know many people are familiar with Python, but this is a core part of the language. <coughs> and, is, and is automatically converted um, into a list. In Python, Two, uh, dictionary are not guaranteeing in any case the order. So if you need to, while associations are always ordered, so if you need uh, a data structures that, um, that, that guarantees the order, there is order addict in built-in Python, and we are supporting this as well, if you can. Speed up. Hmm? Speed up, we don't have to. Okay. Speed. Yeah, speed up. And um, yeah, then we have data types like strings. As I was saying, string is converted into a regular string, while by while byte array, uh, while bytes is converted into by into a byte array. Uh, we also have support from uh, for all kinds of number like the decimal, and is uh, converted using uh, um, fixed precision. Complex are also converted. Infinity, indeterminate, are also converted to the right symbol in Mathematica directly. Fractions are also supported. Those are all built-in modules in Python. They are transformed to rational. And we got support for data as well. So as you can see, like all those data types, you cannot really convert them easily with JSON. You need to invent your way uh, to serialize those type because in JSON they're not supported. You only have floating point number, integers, true, false, none, and strings. That's it. There is no support for, for dates and you need to always parse the string. So on the other end with this, uh, uh, with this library we are providing a one-to-one -one conversion for a lot of native data types. So <coughs> time is converted to time object, the date time object, and also the date object are automatically converted. Time delta are converted using quantities, which makes sense for us as well, because in Python you can sum a time delta with a date, and you get out another date. In Wolfram language you can sum a date object with a quantity and get out another date. And we're also supporting uh, <coughs> date object with uh, 
timestamps, uh, sorry, uh, time aware information. And this is how you can create your own uh, uh, normalization. So let's say that you have a class that needs to produce some arbitrary code, like a date object, like uh, whatever it is, like an association with several information inside. You can easily do that by importing our uh, Wolfram language serializable. You inherit from this guy, and then you define this method. And this method needs to return one of the primitive that I just showed you. And this will recursively normalize your class and do the recursion appropriately. So this, you see that this class was returning my Wolfram language function with some argument that I was sending into init. And so now my Python class becomes my Wolfram language function. <coughs> when serialized. We're also supporting uh, one third party data type that is uh, NumPy arrays and they are efficiently uh, transformed into um, numeric array by just taking uh, the C representation that NumPy is using and moving it into the, the, the serialization. This is a, this can be done only with WXF. And uh, yeah, I mean, just a quick, uh, a quick tour of basically the performance improvement that we managed to do between 11.2 uh, and 12 by switching to WXF. WXF, what is WXF? Very quickly because we don't have much time, but uh, WXF is a binary representation of expressions. It's an open format that is documented. You can see the documentation. And the nice thing about it is that it can be implemented as serializer and deserialized in almost every language. We started by doing Python, um, which means that from Mathematica, you can serialize to WXF and read it back from Python. Or from Python, you can, use, uh, you can basically use this binary format that is open and documented to produce arbitrary expression. Before, we were just using a naive implementation of the serialization. It was just using input form. And that would get terrible performance. And now with WXF, you can see that there is a, a consistent speed up. And um, <clears throat> yeah, as I was saying, the, the, the main entry point will allow you in, in one case to just say target format WXF. And this got now back by the way. Oops. And the binary can be interpreted by doing import by the way of this guy WXF. And this will give you back the expression. Uh, of course, you can dump it to a file. There is a syntax to do that. If you just send here a, a string, then uh, it's been written on a file. Or otherwise, you can use a context manager to open a file and export to a file-like object in Python. That works with uh, files, string.io, bytes.io, all file-like objects in Python. I just need to provide a write method and, uh, and it will work with them. And this realization also work uh, by a single entry point. So you take a dump, you do binary deserialize, and you get back the very same uh, expressions. And there is a, a method to customize what to do when reading uh, the WXF dump. So it, this is all documented, so this is just a quick overview. I think like if you are interested, you can go and read the documentation. It's like uh, very easy to, and I think it, we, we did our best to, to write it in a way that it's easy and comprehensible to people. So I will just ask Dorian to go ahead now. Okay. So let's move on to the, the next step. So, so far we were only representing expressions. So. It was maybe a bit confusing 
because uh, we represent the expression in Python. And when the expression goes out and come arrive in the kernel, we know what to do with it and evaluate it. But all, what, all the examples that now I'm going to show, you, you, you have to imagine that we, we are in a Python interpreter and we stay inside the, in, the Python interpreter all the time. So if you see an evaluation, it will happen uh, without the kernel that is used to, to do the presentation, sort of. So it, we are going to show the, the, the use case of a pure Python uh, uh, program, sort of. So I'm going to demo you uh, how the library managed to uh, issue, uh, issue <laughs> to evaluate expression uh, on a local kernel. Uh, eventually, also evaluate many expression in parallel, and um, and then move on to interaction with the Wolfram Cloud. That we have a lot of ball of code plate that we have implemented, and um, and see yeah uh, how we can call API and evaluate in the cloud. So let's start. So the main class to interact with the Wolfram kernel is a, is the Wolfram language session. And also, as we as we saw, there is uh, one very convenient way to represent expression, which is the factory WL. So I import it. I import, I import both of them. Then, obviously, if I co connect and interact with the kernel, I need to specify the path. So this is typically. Uh, the path to a kernel uh, if you have a, a Mac. And so I specify it, and then I, I, I define, I, I initialize my, my session, okay. So for the moment, there is not much that happened. Because as you can imagine, uh, if you interact with the kernel, you need a process. And, and so you need to start it, manage it, eventually terminate it. So, the good point is that you don't have to actually initialize since if the session is not initialized when you first evaluate, we do it for you. And okay, so that's why it took maybe one second for, to evaluate these things, but if I do it again, it's, it's immediate. So here, y y y this, this, this code was totally in Python. So I was in Python, I sent a string to, I mean, I define a string reverse function that Python does not really know what it is. I apply it to a string, which is a Python string, and I get back a Python string that, luckily, the kernel can also serialize. So that's why I also get a Wolfram string, a Wolfram string in the, as, as output. And if you were in Python, it would be a Python string. And now I can also uh, start to see how it, it's, this can be very useful. Because with this kind of stuff and uh, class, and, uh, you can see the Wolfram language as a, a huge library of functions that you can call from Python very efficiently. And so here, for example, I want to use Wolfram Alpha, which has probably no equivalent. And I don't know, see, what's the population of Illinois, for example? So I evaluate it, it's a bit longer because Wolfram Alpha is, oh, I, am I connected? We'll see, we'll figure out, okay. And so Wolfram Alpha re is returning me uh, a quantity and I happen to know what to do with it. And so that's why it, it is serialized uh, nicely. I, I think with the example I, I'm going to show just after that, that you can actually keep on working on the expression from the Python side, even if you don't really know what it is. But I, I, I just I showed this example and maybe I, I, uh, you so tell me you, if it's, you it makes sense. That's the thing I'm going to, to show. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Thank you for spoiling everything. <laughs> <laughs> So for this presentation, we start in the Wolfram language in Mathematica. We go into Python, yes. But this is uh, artificial. Exactly, and then from Python, we go to another kernel and get back the result, and then eventually goes out to Python into this presentation notebook. So you have a surrounding Wolfram language uh, layer that, that is artificial. So it's connected to the Wolfram Alpha too, it's not uh, from the kernel. The inner one, yes. The, yeah. 
So you, sometimes it can be very cumbersome to, to write uh, expressions uh, using WL dot something because if you think about, for example, uh, uh, functions and when you have slots in, in them, etc. And so we, we implemented the, 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 the evaluation using uh, pure string. So you can type input, input form and it will just work. Okay, so that, that's very convenient for, from time to time. Uh, you can, I mean, as, as, as Ricardo showed you, you can mix and match uh, native Python type with symbols. So you can apply, for example, min max onto a Python array. Mm -hmm. You're just sending it to the scratch. Yes. You're, you're not just scratch we, 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 we inferred that probably there is no use case to evaluate a pure string in a kernel. No, so that's, to, yeah. Like a, there was a, a way to transmit a single form uh -huh. into a WL page as an ID type. No, because if you, so the question is, can you more or less serialize input form from Python? And the answer is no, we can't. I mean, we decided not to, to go in this direction. It's probably complicated. Maybe, yeah. So I'm going to, be, to, to explain uh, more or less what, what you ask, I think. So let's say I want to, to compute the, the age of the Mont Blanc. So this, as, as we saw, it's, it's a quantity. So in Python, usually, if you get back a quantity, you, you don't really know what to do with it. I mean, you could, you could extract the value maybe, but okay. But now I say, okay, I get back the quantity, and uh, actually, I, I should show it. So it's, it's in fits. But let's say I'm using the metric system. So I'd like, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I'd like to, to do unit convert on it first, so that I get meters. As you can see, I can pass the variable. This is a Python variable, and I pass it into my, uh, my expressions and, and convert it. But now I'm not done, because I say, uh, I, I'd like to, to have a value, a numeric value, because in Python, you, you don't really care what the quantity is. And so I apply quantity magnitude on top of my last result, and so, I get back this time a real number. And uh, this, this example is a bit artificial because I could have uh, of obviously called quantity magnitude of unit convert of the result from or from alpha. But imagine you have something, you can have some intermediate, intermediary steps where it's pure Python, for example. So you can check for whatever you want. Yeah. I think it's the next slide. <laughs> Oops. Uh, maybe the next, next slide. <laughs> but yeah, so it's, the, as I told you, the, you, you start a process in the hood, so. The session is persistent, yes. Yes, uh, no, uh, I mean, it's uh, more or less. But WL is a factory. So when you do WL dot something, it produces uh, a, an object. And this, this eight is this kind of object. It's WL function. Oh, it's not serializable, so. Yes, so you can do args, I think, and it's the second args, so I think it's this. No, so it's zero. Yeah, you can. Part, you mean, for, for example? Yeah, maybe. You can implement it. It's an open source project. <laughs> so we accept your contributions. Just file a PR and. 
Ah, interesting. <laughs> It's, yeah, yeah, yes, definitely, yes. So we, yeah, if you, you, we encourage, so if you have contributions, of course, that's the, the, the best, but you can also have some uh, ideas that you want implemented and we can. So this is in Flask, right? Not, not in Flask. No, it's on GitHub, actually. No, 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 I mean, you know, what sensibility for Flask? Is it in the MVPH? Yeah. 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 In the library. The library was tested on 11.3. You have better performances with 12, but for a demo, I mean, yeah. So it works for, for 12. Um, okay, so, but session persistency. Actually, I was right. It was the next slide, okay. So uh, I define a function. So it written nothing in Python, so I get none. And uh, as you may know, when you define variables as a, uh, in, a, in a session, by default, they are in the global context. And actually, I can do. No, that's, that was stupid because this is not this session; it's the other one, the next one. Okay. And so, if I want to call it, I can use the again the constructor, and uh, and apply my function to Python integer. And yes, okay. If you if you forget about the global uh, the global uh, the global context, then nothing happens because system f is not defined. This wl dot f defines system f, which is not defined. Okay, that can be a bit confusing if you're because we hide the the context for global and system, for example. Uh, so you can also define pure function in Python. So in this case, I'd like to say, I have this uh, select prime q that I'm going to use uh, a lot, for example. And so uh, I, want, I want to store it in a variable as a callable object. So uh, you can say session dot function, have a pure function in it, or not a pure function, but a function. And this does nothing, uh, uh, but then you can apply it on, on a list, and it will evaluate as if you did select prime q or something. And you can you can imagine anything here, even uh, something like uh, I don't know uh, something a, a pure a pure function that abstract. This? No, so that, uh, yeah. Exactly. I, I'm making use of the operator forms. Yes. Which. Um, so it's equivalent to this. I don't know what you mean by functor. Okay, so in, in Python it's called callable, I think. But okay, we talk about the same thing. And so I can apply my prime q again. So in this case I apply prime q on an iterator. So I mix pure Python things that we can't really represent as a function with a with functions. Um, a quick example of parallel evaluation. And which under the hood uh, makes use of what we call a, a pool of kernel. So in this case, I have this uh, this expression which integrates a, a function on a on a on a surface of uh, this type of volumes. Okay, so it's just a way to have a computation that takes around five seconds, as you can see. So I first I define my uh, this entire expressions with which is long to evaluate, so I, I, I'm not going to use wl dot something because it's, it's, it's going to be impossible to read. So instead I copy paste it in a string. Okay. And then I have a bit of code to, to see how long it will take. So I, have, I start uh, the counter and then I parallel evaluate. I have to specify the path of the kernel that, that is going to be, I mean, passed to the executable. And then I evaluate uh, four, four times this, this expression which has some randomness in it. And I, let's see how, how the result was. So something went wrong. Yeah. Oh, nice. Okay, so let's use the, the former example. But what I wanted to show is that I have four time, four expressions that takes five, five seconds to evaluate. And it evaluates in the end, I mean yesterday, but still, 
uh, in seven seconds, which is more or less two seconds to start the kernels for them, and then five seconds each on each kernel. So I, in this case, I had four kernels that managed to start in time and, and consume the, the expression to evaluate. And for some reason, I, I, <laughs> I, have, some, I have a bug with external evaluate, I think. Uh, oh, okay, it worked. Oh no, okay, so, so I, I, I had an error. Hmm? No, if you use parallel evaluate, it will start a pool to the evaluation and, f and terminate it. If you, if you, if you want to use a, a kernel pool as a, a kernel session, that the, the one that I was using before, which you need to start and, and stop, you need to use the underlying class that I'm not going to show in this example, but it's documented. I, I, we, haven't, we haven't show you the, the documentation, but there is a, uh, a very big documentation uh, where everything is explained um, with first the, the, the basic use cases and then if you want to go deeper, we have advanced examples. And so I invited you to, to check for the documentation. So parallelize in Python. That's my next slide, I think. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> so, uh, no, j just first before I, I go to the, to the last part, which is really advanced, so I, I was not sure I had time to do it. Uh, when you start a session, you need to terminate it all the time. Why is that? You know that in the Wolfram language has some licensing restrictions, for example. So if you have more than n kernels running, you cannot start a new one. So. You, you need, it's like a database connection, it's like a file, like anything. You, when you open it, you need to close it. So let's close the session. Uh, but sometimes, I mean, it depends what you want to do, but it can be very useful to, 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 delay, uh, to, to delegate this, the, the session management to the Python interpreter. So in this case, you can use the with structures. So it's, it's like uh, open, if you're familiar to it, with it. So you do with. Uh, Wolfram language session as a session here. And then you can use it and terminate it. Can I? Okay. <laughs> no, I had this weird bug. I don't know what it was, but okay. Um, this is very useful when, for, because if you, if you have some code that raise exceptions, for example, and you don't catch them, you end up not terminating your session and your code is going to run four times maybe six, eight, and after the ninth uh, attempt, it's going to, to, to print a failure because it cannot start a new kernel because you have already eight kernels, often kernels running. It's always a good idea to use uh, the kernels when yeah. possible. When possible. Exactly. Except if you want it to be stored I don't know, in a class and use, because also you have to know that, of course, there is a cost to start a kernel. It's more or less one second. So you, in order to mitigate it, you, you start the session and store it somewhere and, and use it, obviously. I thought about adding something. I, I have one for me. I mean, it's not really, it's a one-liner in shell. Uh, so it, you, you, can, you can do, you can check for the processes, check for Wolfram kernels, and then check for a specific function that I call to start the kernel that is not even in, uh, in system. So it's fairly, with, with really few grips, you, you can kill all the kernels uh, that are. <laughs> it's just that, for example, on Windows, it's probably a different way of doing it. But I, I, I thought about doing it. Um, so there was a question. Maybe I. So before I move on to the more advanced topic of uh, concurrent processes and, uh, and coroutines and how to evaluate in parallel from Python, I, uh, I will quickly show you maybe the, the cloud, how you interact with the cloud. So you have, similarly to a local kernel, you have a Wolfram cloud session. This one uh, doesn't have to be terminated because it does not restore anything uh, critical. Um, by default, we are uh, targeting the Wolfram public cloud, but you can specify your own server if you have one, like a private, uh, private cloud, for example. 
Um, you can call an API. So for the moment, I'm going to, to do, I'm not authenticated. But I'm going to, so I'm going to call a public API of my own. And uh, this one is uh, printing a range uh, and, and output the format as a, as a JSON string. So how you define an API? You can define an API with a tuple. So you specify the username, uh, which is the first part of the URL here. And then you specify the relative path to your home directory. So let's do that. And then you simply do cloud.call, my API that I have defined. And of course, an API needs some inputs. I mean, not all the time, but this one expects uh, I variables and, and so on. I evaluate using five. And so since a lot of things can happen in the, when you call the cloud, you, you, in, in this case, the result is not directly the, 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 the evaluations. So you can check whether or not there was a success, it was successful or not. In this case, it was. OK, good. And so you get back the result as uh, now that you are used to this. Uh, <laughs> A mix and match of kernels and Python stuff, you can infer that this, this was a byte, a byte string, so bytes in Python 3. And so I can directly import it as a JSON uh, a string and, or byte array and, and get back the result. Okay, so this was uh, with the kernel, but now let's say I, uh, I, I want to stay in Python, so I just import JSON and do the same, import my JSON result, and I would get back an array Python array, okay? So what if I want to, to authenticate in three minutes? Um, so to authenticate with the cloud, you need, uh, you need to generate a, a pair of uh, secured key to authenticate yourself so that you, you, you don't have to uh, use your Wolfram ID and password. And, uh, and I, have, I have one, so it's this one. So it's two long chain of uh, uh, base64 encoded string, okay. So I'm going to use this pair, consumer key and consumer secret. They represent more or less my login and password. So, so I import the, the classes that represent this, this way of authenticating. I create a session using my, my two informations. And this time I, I start a class session using uh, authentication equal and this secure authentication key. And now I can check that I am authorized. Okay. And with this, I can now do cloud evaluation because uh, my account, I have an account on, the public, on the, the public cloud, so I can evaluate expression in the cloud. Ah, too late. So, oh. External evaluates, you have now three steps. You can, when, when an error is happening in Python, you have the check for the residue, like one without a space zero in the yeah. cloud. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 one divided by zero, just to say. Uh, yeah, I guess, yeah. Okay. So that's, that is going to raise it really with an error in Python, and you will see that you can So it's no more black box when something goes wrong and exactly <laughs> and you have the full stack <laughs> all the variables no, no, no. it's external evaluate features yes Okay, so contrary to a local kernel, this is one shot evaluation. So if I define X and evaluate it, it does not exist anymore. You probably are familiar with it. You can define function as well, targeting the cloud. And so now, maybe to finish, 30 seconds, uh, concurrent features and asyncio, probably not the, the simplest part, but. So if you want to start evaluation in parallel, uh, you, you can use, we have two classes, because in Python you have two ways to do that. Uh, either using a uh, concurrent feature, uh, which is uh, thread-based, is or using uh, asyncio, which was introduced in 3.5 or 4, which is uh, based on coroutines. So you have a loop, 
with events and when an event occurred, um, well, I'm not going to explain that. I mean, it's, it's, it's event-based. And so if you, if you start a Wolfram language, future session, this one is returning future objects, which means that you, you do, when you evaluate something here, instead of having the result immediately, as you can see, I'm doing a pause too, so it's going to sleep for two seconds and then evaluate something. You get back immediately something, an object, that you can use to say, is the result already available or not? And, and so you can do other stuff, and at some point when you actually need the result, you can, you can call on your future object result with a timeout. And, and, so, and so as you can see, I start the session, uh, I start the session, I evaluate something that is slow. The evaluation took one milliseconds, and I get back my future object, and after two seconds, my future object is available and with the result that I'm expecting. And you can do stuff similar with asyncio. Uh, okay, so without syntax coloring, it's even harder to follow, but uh, syntaxio is uh, very useful when you have, uh, well, EO operation that takes a fair amount of time. You can parallel, uh, evaluate in, in parallel in the, as a background task, wait for some result, gather the result. And so in this example, the main, the main part is here. So I do ensure future, which means evaluate this coroutine uh, in parallel and returns me something that I can then await. And I start another one here. And, uh, and those are actually delayed with uh, asyncio. So imagine you have uh, a database something uh, that's happening, a file operation that takes some time that uses asyncio. So in this example, it's fake, so I'm using sleep only, and then I evaluate. And uh, if you do that, again, uh, you can see that I evaluate two tasks, but it takes two seconds. So it evaluates in parallel, as expected. Sure. That's so this is the GitHub repository. We just added everything yesterday. Uh, you have all the source code um, available. You, oh, you have one branch. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> uh, you also, it's master. Oh, yes. <laughs> Your power user. <laughs> so you have uh, documentations uh, that it's for the moment it's stored in a temporary uh, locations, but it's uh, pretty much, uh, it's well advanced. Um, it's using the, the, the standard Python uh, way of documenting things. You have a how to install it. Then you have an introductions. Uh, introductions to, to all, more or less all that we discussed today with uh, examples, et cetera, et cetera. So, and, and then you have also, so as you can see, you have a lot of topics covered on the side. This is only on, on this page. And then you have also an advanced part where you have the asyncio examples, for example, with uh, syntax coloring. You can copy paste the code in Quest immediately, and uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you.